a good evening and welcome to Kolkata Center for Creativity. I'm Shrabusti. I would like to start the second year of Kolkata Center for Creativity's first annual conference, Performing Performance 2020, on the theme Women in Performance. Today's topic is Agency in Performance. We, Kolkata Center for Creativity, a multidisciplinary interactive arts center of Kolkata, has been working in the areas of research and development in diverse art practice, inclusivity, and capacity building, well-being through debates, discussions, presentations, promotions, appreciation, and applications of different art disciplines in cultural landscape of contemporary India since November 2018. In its holistic approach, the research and developmental practice and presentation of art culminates into application and accessibility in well-being, providing a bridge between artists, scholars, students, enthusiasts, and people from different communities with diversity of choices, opportunities, and challenges. Thus, today's conference carries special significance for us. We hope this conference will facilitate the discussion further in practice, policy making, and social application. First, I would like to introduce the flow of today's evening. We'll start with the welcome address by our director, Mr. Najaban, and after that, we'll move to the keynote speech. Then I'll introduce our moderator of today's evening, and she is going to take the evening forward from there. The moderator will introduce the panel, and we'll start with Dr. Anuradha Kapoor, then Ms. Zulekha Chaudhary and then Dr. Unmimala Sharkar Munshi. After this, the floor will be open for question, answer, and discussion. We'll wrap up with our collaborators' video along with the closing note by our director. If you have any comments, please put it up in the chat box and for questions in the question answer box. As we have limited time, we may not be able to address all the questions, but we will try to get back to you with possible answers. Now I'd like to introduce our director, Ms. Rina Duban. Apart from being the director of Kolkata Center for Creativity, Ms. Duban is also serving the responsibility as the president of ICOM India and a board member of ICOM Intercom. She has been spearheading many projects in KCC to promote research and development of different disciplines of art that leads to a volumetric qualitative impact, not only in the art field, but to the society and young artists and performers. She champions and facilitates inclusion, diversity, and gender equality in museums and art spaces. She's pioneering social changes, creating an inclusive culture in KCC that addresses different abilities and choices, gender and sexuality diversity, and marginalization of communities through appreciation and application of art. Recipient of several prestigious fellowships, she has presented papers in museum conferences on various international platforms. I would request Ms. Ranadhuban to present her welcome note for opening the conference. Thank you. On behalf of Kolkata Center for Creativity, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the second day of the conference, Performing Performance 2020. I welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Ananya Chatterjia, our panelist, Dr. Anuradha Kapoor, Dr. Urmi Malasharkar Munshi, Ms. Zulekha Chaudhary, and moderator of today's evening is Dr. Trina Nilina Benerji. Yesterday, our panelists opened up the conference with their diverse conversations on body and performance. Shaheen Bagh protests took the center stage in the presentations of our three panelists, whereas the legendary Luhna Mariam, our keynote speaker, spoke about the role of training, abstract versus discipline, and importance of Shrishti for an artist. As a cultural center, KCC works on various approaches in art and cultural landscape. On one hand, we work with emerging artists for bringing experimental works. And on the other hand, we work with senior scholars and practitioners through workshops, talks, and webinars. With this interaction of theory and practice, we ensure there is a constant dialogue and knowledge sharing. We base this conference on the same principle, and therefore for us, today is 
one of the significant days of this journey. I want to thank all our collaborators who have been with us as our outreach partners. And I would like to thank each one of you for being with us today evening. I'm really looking forward to having an enriching sessions with you all. Thank you. Over to you, Shravasti. Thank you, ma'am. Now we'll move to our keynote speech and we are very happy to have Dr. Anina Chatterjee as keynote speaker. I would like to introduce her. Anina Chatterjee's work as choreographer, dancer and thinker brings together contemporary dance, social justice, choreography and the philosophy of Occupy Dance. She is the artistic director of Anina Dance Theatre and co-founder of the Shangram Institute for Performance and Social Justice. Her people power dances and transformation proceed through concert performances and participatory performances in non-traditional spaces where audiences become co-creators of movement explorations. She is the recipient of various awards and fellowships. Chatterjee is currently creating Dasta, a dance theater work exploring borders, boundaries, home and belonging. With the support of an NPN Creation Fund, NDP Production Award, and a two-part MANCC residency. Her new book, Heat and Alterity in Contemporary Dance, South-South Choreographies, is currently in the process of publication with Palgriff Macmillan. Anina is Professor of Dance at University of Minnesota, where she teaches courses in dance studies, social justice, choreography, and contemporary dance. Today, her paper's title is How is Essential Dancing Choreographies Towards Justice? Anna, over to you. Thank you, Srabusti. Thank you to the Kolkata Center for Creativity. I'm really excited that I'm here with these amazing thinkers. Yesterday was a great beginning. Choreographies Towards Justice. For those of us who were raised in the reconstructed narratives of Indian classical dance, this moment is heavy. And I want to acknowledge that we have much work to do to claw back our artistic practices from a co-optation by forces of hate and neocolonialism. Working agentially in dance, especially now, means grappling with the hierarchies and privileges inherent in our dance and the ecosystem of performance and moving the needle towards justice as best as we can. I describe myself as a social justice choreographer and I work with an amazing group of women and women with an ex and femmes from black, indigenous and communities of color to make what we call quote, people-powered dances of transformation. The biggest lesson I have learned through my artistic path is the urgency of developing the capacity to hold multiplicity. So we never allow the category of women to indicate only cisgender, heterosexual, middle and upper class, Hindu, Savarna, assigned fe female at birth people. So when we talk about women's performance, we build a, a category that is as expansive as it is multiple and complex. A category where the difference of our experiences, struggles and dreams is what is at center. So I'll speak from my experience because that's how best I can understand this concept of agency. So I grew up in Kolkata and I experienced the struggle around class and gender narratives most sharply. Yet the vicious patriarchal stronghold that so many of us continue to struggle with, even inside politically progressive circles, was only one part of the battle. Our left front government entrenched from 1977 swept caste violences under the rhetoric of class struggle. And as the massacre at Mori Jhaki and the subsequent cover-ups proved, there was no real commitment towards a holistic notion of justice. On the other hand, so many of us grew up dancing Tagore's dance drama Chandalika. I loved dancing the articulation of Prakriti's passion, her hungering love, 
especially because it gave me and other middle-class Bengali girls like me from Bhadralok families, the opportunity to dance boldly about desire without repercussions. There were few other places for that. Yet I did not wonder then, like I do now, why I had never seen a dancer from the Dalit Bahujan community play the role of Prakriti. The agency I carved for myself in dancing this beautiful work was limited because I didn't learn to look for the absences and silences in the world around me. However, growing up as an artist in Kolkata at that time also offered other opportunities to understand how, what agency could mean in the performing arts. This was different from what I experienced in much of my classical dance training, which upheld the tremendous power of beauty, but advocated for an unquestioning submergence into that harmonious and ultimately idealized worldview. Witnessing Badol Sharkar's radical theater in my college square, dancing the choreography of Shombhu Bhattacharj to Hemango Bishash's songs, the legacy of the anti-colonial Indian People's Theater Association movement rooted me in the power of political artistry. It taught me the power of weaving together deep local roots and transnational solidarities crucial elements for carving an agential creative process. But where were the women creators? Fed up with the incestuous relationships between money, connections, and visibility in the Indian dance world. And I must give a nod to the amazing Munjusri Chaki Sharkar and Chandralekha who worked powerfully at that time and many others. But it was difficult to access. Those worlds were often difficult to access for some of us. At any rate, fed up with the incestuous relationship between money, connections, and visibility in the Indian dance world and aching to find a contemporary rhythm to my choreography, I left for New York in 1989 to pursue graduate studies in dance and dance education in Columbia University's Teachers College. From then till now, I have had to chisel a path for myself to anchor my dance making in social justice. While I had no formal training in choreography, Kolkata's heartbeat pushed me to understand that dance did not ever need to tell a linear story, but could offer a layered mosaic of many different stories held together by the glue of internal thematic resonance, what I call the Shangram methodology. And from my training in global feminist movements, I learned the exigency of holding multiple stories at once and with nuance in the curve of my spine, in the angularities of my elbows and the asymmetrical rhythm circles of my footwork. My teachers in multiple spheres emboldened me to refuse aesthetic and intellectual colonization and insist on carving my contemporaneity in my own terms. Not the cool, hip, Euro irony that dominates today's conceptual dance, nor the grand standing narratives of tradition fabricated by nationalists. Consequently, I've come to understand agency as a commitment to investigating the simultaneity of unearned privileges in some realms, say as a Savarna woman, and marginalizations in others as a brown immigrant woman and to always holding up lesser known histories of radical resistance and empowerment in dancing. This means that I must take every opportunity to bend the contemporary dance form that I have created to build capacity for nuance, multiplicity, multiple revolutions, and for imaginations of just futures yet to be born. This means exploring how legacies of colonization come to be lodged inside what we find beautiful and powerful. And so in tracing the line of agency, I land on granular embodied self-reflexivity and the affective value of our artistic practices. I ask, how can I choreograph love and intimacy in ways that are not immediately grafted onto cisgender heterosexual bodies? 
Does my performance of Vatsalya, a mother's love for her child, make room for the grief of Rohit Vemula's mother? And the mother George Floyd called out to as he was being murdered by the police. How can we articulate the boundaries of our bodies and insist on consent in touch in choreographic practice? How can I explain to the lighting designer, even as he tries to dismiss me in a typically gendered way, that his cool and shadowy design is lighting primarily the lighter skinned dancers and invisibilizing the darker skinned ones? Such questions have been my haunting in my choreographic journey. And I want to refer briefly to the work I'm currently engaged in. And before that, I want to uh, remember that it is Gauri Lankesh Day and the beginning of the movement of If We Don't Rise. Um, so I want to say that I created, I'm beginning, began to create Dastak last year. At that time, we thought the work would be called Agun. But as the, choreo as the world has developed in different ways, it has come to be known as Dastak knockings of justice on our hearts. Um, and I'll quickly show you two short clips. The, the first one is from um, a work that the work I pre premiered last year, uh, Sutrajal. And just to show you the way in which I work with design. <laughs> And then I will show you Dastak, because um, during the uprising in Minneapolis, um, our Shangram Institute was a little bit damaged. At any rate, we can't be inside. So we started working in public parks. Now, they're also at the same time in Minneapolis, the housing crisis has just exploded. And all of our public parks have encampments of unhoused people in them. We started rehearsing in a public park that is close to my house. And then, and it, it you know, it was a shade. It, it had shade under the trees. And then the sanctuary, which is an unhoused, an encampment of unhoused women, primarily over, you know, 60 and older, um, primarily native peoples, who are the inhabitants, original inhabitants of this land, um, that it, is spread out there. So we started to move away and then move away farther and farther. Um, and working, building capacity to work in the sun, in the heat, in the dust, has been quite something to understand. Yet when we look across and see the women in the sanctuary just across the park, um, it's something really important to, for us to learn. Um, I'm going to quickly share the last have been uh, creating. This is a section of Earth. Challenges of uh, working outside. Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, I wanted to show those two different clips to suggest what it means to have agency when working through the multi multiple pandemics of the coronavirus, of racism, of uh, violence against indigenous peoples and poor peoples. Um, so agency, shaping my relation, dance in relationship to the sanctuary of unhoused women apprises me both of my privilege and my responsibility. Agency is that fine line of empowerment that I draw when I bend my privilege towards responsible artistry and dedicate my dance to the forces of justice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anunadi, and thank you for setting the tune in such a way. Thank you. So uh, now we need to move uh, to our main panel. I'll now introduce our moderator of today's evening, Dr. Trinani Dina Banerjee. After completing her master's in English literature from Jadavpur University, she proceeded to complete a master's of studies in English at the University of Oxford. For her PhD, she worked on a history of women in the group theater movement in Bengal between 1950 and 1980. She has also been researching the interfaces between women's movements and political theater in contemporary Manipur for several years now. Her essays and reviews on these and other subjects have appeared in national and international journals, as well as in several edited volumes. She writes both in English and Bangla. Between 2011 and 2013, she taught at the Theater and Performance Studies Department at the School of Arts and Aesthetics in Jawaharlal Nehru University. She is currently Assistant Professor in Cultural Studies at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Kolkata. Her essays have been published in several edited volumes and national and international journals. She writes in both her research interests include gender performance, political theater, theories of the body, post-colonial theater, and South Asian history. She has also been a theater and film actress, as well as a journalist and fiction writer. Her book, Performing Silence, Women in the Group Theater Movement in Bengal, is forthcoming from Oxford University Press. Now I would request Dr. Banerjee to take this over from here. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to me to be here this evening. Uh, I would like to thank Kolkata Center for Creativity, uh, Rina, um, Titash, Srapusti, everyone who's been uh, sort of instrumental in making this happen uh, for inviting me. And uh, it's really a great honor for me to introduce uh, um, three speakers whose work I have um, admired sometimes from the distance, not sometimes in some uh, fortunate proximity over the years. Um, the thing is also that they don't really need much of an introduction, but uh, since uh, this is the order of the day, uh, let me sort of briefly introduce uh, the three speakers. Um, we first have uh, Dr. Anuradha Kapoor, uh, whose work I'm a great admirer of. Um, Dr. Anuradha Kapoor is a theater maker and professor. She taught at the National School of Drama for over three decades and was the director of the National School of Drama for six years between 2007 and 2013. She's a founding member of Vivadi, a working group of theater practitioners, visual artists, filmmakers, musicians, and writers. She co-curated the, the theater section of the Serendipity Arts Festival in Goa in 2016-2017. Her theater work has traveled widely in India and abroad. She's presently visiting, visiting professor at Ambedkar University, Delhi. For her work as a theater director, the Sangeet Natak Academy Award, Award was conferred on her in 2004. Her writings on performance have been widely anthologized, and her book, Actors, Pilgrims, Kings and Gods, The Ramlila at Ramnagar, was published by Siegel Books Calcutta uh, in 1993 and the second edition in 2004. 
We next have uh, Zulekha Chaudhary, who also needs uh, very little introduction. Zulekha Chaudhary is a theater director and a lighting designer based in Delhi. Her work shifts between a theater and installation. Her ongoing research considers the structures and codes of performance, as well as the function and processes of the actor as reality and truth production. Her current research uses archival documents, texts, and photographs to develop, a theatrical, develop theatrical performances as a way of thinking about the relationship between production of memory, the role of the archive, and how that pertains to the retrieval and reliving of an event. These works use a combination of reportage, portraiture, documentary, and fiction, the editing, reinterpretation, and repositioning of speculative ideas, opinions, beliefs, and anecdotes towards the production of new narratives, uh, which are central to these investigations about the relationship between history and theater. 2015 onwards, she has been exploring the framework of law as performance, the role of performance in law, and the performativity of legal truth production. She is a recipient of a number of awards and artist residence, residencies. Her works have been shown at various festivals uh, across the world. Um, uh, some, some of them are the Asian Art, Art Biennale, the Johannesburg Art Gallery, the Alpha Gallery, Stuttgart and Berlin. She is currently the director of the Alkazi Theatre Archives at the Alkazi Foundation for the Arts, New Delhi. Uh, we next have Dr. Urmi Mala Sharkar, who is in fact a friend and was a former colleague when I was uh, teaching at JNU. Um, Dr. Urmi Mala Sharkar Munshi is an Associate Professor of Theatre and Performance Studies at the School of Arts and Aesthetics at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Her specialization is dance studies, visual anthropology, and ethnographic research. Her current work is on changing landscapes of dance in India, trafficking violence against women, and designing of survival processes for survivors. Politics of performance, gender, labor, identities, hierarchies. Urmimala is currently the president of World Dance Alliance Asia Pacific. She's the co-editor of the peer-reviewed open access online journal of emerging dance scholarship, uh, JEDS. Urmimala was a co-investigator for the recently concluded, concluded project, Crisis of Democracy and, Culture, and Cultural Trauma, 2018-2019. Uh, her recent most book is The Moving Space, Women in Dance, uh, edited by Urmimala Sharkar and Oshika Chakraborty, uh, published from Primus Books in 2018. Her autoethnographical essay, Revisiting Being Rama, Playing a God in Changing Times, co-edited by Paula Richman and Rustam Barucha, is being published by Oxford. Oxford University Press, New York. Um, I have a uh, great pleasure and honor in inviting all of you uh, to the panel. Just to briefly uh, sort of reiterate, uh, each speaker has about 15 minutes. A couple of them have requested for two or three minutes more, so we will uh, take that. Um, at the end of all the three, uh, the, uh, three uh, presentations, we will open the floor for questions. I'll briefly sum up uh, the ideas in the papers. So first, uh, we have Professor Anuradha Kapoor. Her paper is titled Collaboration in Classroom and Studio. Dr. Kapoor. Yes. Thank you very much um, for introducing me. And thank you, KCC, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Shabashti. Thank you, Titash, for holding my hand through various technological glitches. I've been asked to put before you some thoughts on my journey as a theater maker, processes that I have worked with in the studio and in the classroom over several years. But my journey, like all personal journeys, has been foundationally shaped by particular political and historical articulations that women theater makers of my generation have made. Furthermore, these journeys are imbricated into feminist theater practices in other parts of the world that came to be expressed around the same juncture as we began work, which is in the 1980s. Collaboration is the largest frame in which I seek to place feminist theater practices in India, including mine, that women practitioners have elected to work in the collaborative mode also sometimes called collective creation and devising, is well known and well documented. Multi-authorship in the rehearsal room is a way of fracturing the compelling aura of the guru, an ever-present figure in the pedagogy of performance. 
of attempting to turn the course of a single channel unidirectional flow of ideas and of loosening the desire for acquiring solid, over conclusive knowledge in the studio and classroom for the trainee. Collaboratory practices, in some senses, desire to redistribute creative energies and create several lines of thoughts, imaginations, and intuitions in order to shape a multi altered, multi vocal project that allows for the possibility of calling into question, and I quote, authority authorship and attribution. I'd like to image the word collaboration as a field and bring in the word horizontality here. Horizontality, I suggest, is a leveling of artistic choices, options, languages, grammars that are present before a practitioner. Choices that traditionally and most often appear shaped like pyramids. At the peak, the playwright with the pre-written text, then the director, then the actor, and thereafter the other nuts and bolts of the stage. If leveled, these very choices present themselves as rhizomes, where actor, writing, material, text, nuts and bolts, scenography, music, objects, all interlink and make a pattern with no structural hierarchy or beginnings, middles and ends. The nature of the link or joint between one element for the stage and the other is therefore critical. The link may be quirky, delicate, tenuous. Props, objects, layers of fabric may populate the stage and appear surplus. Costumes may adapt textile and drapery beyond and away from the demands of period and context. A plywood wall may be hacked down to reveal a mount of roses. This very likely blows the storyline, but its very supplementarity denaturalizes habits of viewing, expectations of story, and produces a disparate, multifocal experience. Many women theater makers have used collaboration as methodology and as grammar. Let me put out some of the roots whereby such dramaturgical choices have been made. Slide, please. The itinerary, including my own, starts as did a great deal of feminist practice with consciousness raising issue-based projects that were about the naming of social injustices and of bringing them into the public sphere. These projects attempted, first of all, to devise women as subjects, as protagonists in their stories that were taken from actual documentary research. Slide, please. Om Swaha was a devised play about incidents of murdering women for dowry. Om Swaha was jointly devised by Maya Rao and myself with a woman's collective called Tri Sanghash that was acting in seeking justice for the victims and their families. The play had two endings, therefore opening out the woman's life to question and analysis. Almost at the same time, Jan Natyamanch, slide please, devised a play called Aurat. Both plays were possibly one of the earliest attempts to make a contemporary working class woman the protagonist in a street performance. Different sorts of energies of theater making came together in that quite charged moment. I'm not proposing an originary moment here though, just that it was a conjuncture that allowed us to rethink the languages of theater making for the present and for the future. Slide please. I wish to add the word excess to the words on the screen and signal obliquely to the word Baroque here as well in its commonplace definition. Baroque as extravagance, as bizarre even, as delight in the spectacle, as desire to fashion a range of visual and auditory sensations for the spectator. By heaping excess and ornament on the mise-en-scene in gesture, costume, object, and light. Slide please. Women directors have been seen to be disrespectful to the limits of the containing frame. By introducing polydimensionality that possesses the sensorium in several unpredictable ways and wrecks a certain moderate rational organization of knowledge on the stage. Plus, by citing histories of melodrama in their work, the practice of women theater makers is seen to subvert the dominant form or mode of Hindi theater, at least from the 1950s, 
which is illusionism. Slide, please. From the 1990s onwards, even to this day, there have been a series of plays on female impersonators. Amal Alana, Neela Mansingh Chaudhary, Tripurari Sharma, and myself have made work in which impersonation is the governing convention. Slide, please. Female impersonation has an honored history in India even today across the spectrum of popular and classical forms. The biggest stars of Indian commercial theaters, the legendary Jai Shankar Sundari and Bal Gandhar were female impersonators. Slide, please. Numerous apocryphal tales of how these actors virtually incarnated themselves into women, never being recognized as men in all women's ceremonies, even outside the realm of the theater, are legion. Yet, side by side, we must remember to annotate these very tales as hagiographical narratives, celebrating the male actor's skill of faultlessly manifesting a female avatar. Slide, please. Female impersonation, as we know, works in two distinct ways. One, that it essentializes the attribute of woman for performance. And second, it mobilizes the category of gender itself. That which has seemed inviolable and secure becomes porous and gives away to modification. Slide, please. Disturbance of categories in an active sense to make strange the normal in order to yield unfamiliar meanings from familiar bodies, objects, and costumes to open up category to claim, counterclaim, and competing discourses has remained a dramaturgical strategy of feminist practices. Slide, please. The story of the job, a terrible action, and a terrible risk, and an attention towards reversal. Fighting for her life to, lively, uh, fighting for her life to livelihood, a woman impersonates her dead husband for his job as a watchman, wins awards for bravery, is injured in a blast, wakes up in hospital, discovered to be a woman, she is fired, pleased that this, her labor that defines her and not her gender, is refused her job back, is evicted from the factory with her children, leaves and is not seen again, thrown into that ghetto in the city that is reserved for the uttermost margin. Notice here that Whatever means and whatever skills she adopts, Mrs. Mr. Hausman is not allowed back into any fold of acceptability. Having mimicked the attributes of man, she cannot but be punished. The meaning of skill, of impersonation itself, and of the experiential frame that allows for pleasure or desire to be conjured up for one who can seamlessly transform into the other seem profoundly different in these two registers of impersonation. Slide, please. Conventionally played by a male actor, Maya Rao reinvents the Kathakali Ravan as ground for contradiction. Arrogant, aggressive, haughty, but equally anguished lover, abject, riven with self-doubt. By crossing Kathakali performance dramas with everyday props, Maya scrambles time and period, propelling the character into absolute contemporaneity. Rao's rendering presents Ravan like a palimpsest, an act of overwriting that transports the stuff of epics into discourse. Slide, please. The word material is significant in terms of theater, but needs a gloss. And that takes us to the word in use as one counter to spiritualism of being too much of the world. For the purposes of argument, Materiality here is substantially about matter, and it points to things and bodies in the performing space that significantly affect and affect the lives of beings that populate the mise-en-scene. In the theater, action, when attempted with a solid object of daily life, bricks, tools, water, food, has to obey or disobey the particular protocol of that object. Slide, please. The object prescribes how it needs to be handled with dexterity that real work demands. When the actor is forced to deal with objects of labor, labor, even connected with survival, an appropriately dense acting style must be engineered. A way of looking at acting and action as intelligible representations of moral situations 
which are usually private, says Barthes in the context of wrestling. Slide, please. A long-standing debate about the grammars of Indian folk theater tradition as also Asian theater techniques and how their alienating devices predate and therefore appropriate Brechtian aesthetics has been very much a part of the post-colonial argument about West and non-West, the authentic and the derivative. A calibrated reading of defamiliarization and its effects on the audience has been vigorously debated via work by women. Slide, please. By positing a counter narrative to realism, by showing up the scenes of the character, by crossing the external world constantly with the internal, by employing the theories of making strange refunction in their practice, women directors have sought to promote a reading of performance that has inscribed within it the need to take sides, to be partial. What does the audience do when it sees stories and objects made strange? I'd like to bring in the word ethics here. Ethics derives from the Greek word ethos, habitual character and disposition, moral character. Slide please. Character or habitual disposition is about recognizing and assessing the kind of person you are, not why you became that way. You witness a deed, changing from woman to man, walking off a pyre, thinking you're a ghost in Jivitya Mrit, getting onto a boat and selling body parts in dark, uh, dark things, plastering the town with posters in an act of civil obedience. You see this and you assess it. Slide, please. I might suggest further that such assessment is a way of seeing, a certain mode of spectatorship, and it brings together a relay of ideas, the ethics of seeing, the politics of perception, and the aesthetics of responsibility, response plus ability. Much feminist practice has been interested in activating response from the audience. Slide, please. Anamika Huxa's Uchakka, based on the novel of the same name by Lakshman Gaikwad, attempted to deal with the complex problem of fashioning, quote unquote, a Dalit body for the stage. Slide, please. Dalit literature has produced an explosive language and visceral descriptions of the tissue of life lived, as it were, in the gutter. Portrayals of victimage are less complex to figure, an acting style that can match the descriptions of that life is harder to forge. The performer's body needs to become the starting point in building a dramaturgy that can present a body in extremis. Slide, please. A body that fleshes out the extreme states of hunger, violence, rage, humiliation. This is realigning the relationship between word, body, and action, corporeal thinking. The text is co-authored along with the playwright by action, body, and gesture, and the role is composed not by word or description via the page, but by the particulars of a specific actor's body. Slide, please. When characters are not closed within a physiological body, then they allow us to think through the relationship between the individual and the social structure and agency, mind and body, and the inside and the outside. This is an imaginative re-engagement with the social body that is dispersed in landscape architecture, atmosphere, and objects. Slide, please. Michael Chekhov, the great Russian actor and teacher, exhorts the actor to build a character limb by limb. She suggests that the actor disallows herself the temptation to create full-fledged subjects or persons in one go. In other words, to disjoint the body. I should not be able to annotate the idea of disjointing in this paper, but suffice it to say that to build a character incrementally, limb, stance, gesture, face, eye, is to make a social construction. Slide, please. Any such social construction requires discussion and trial. Observation is compiled and an action is critiqued before it is to taken to performance. To execute such a build calls for collective creation in which knowledge is distributed and circulated in order to actively materialize the social world 
in which the action is embedded. Brecht has an ex example of the gesture as a social undertaking. Chasing away a fly may not be a social gesture, while chasing away a dog most certainly is, considering that a poorly dressed person has a continual battle with watchdogs. In the rehearsal room, constructing the character limb by limb, object by object, material by material, has been very much a part of both the pedagogy and the work of women practitioners. Through improvisation, favoring such fragmentation, the performer might learn in the studio the building blocks of personhood. Impro improvising a body via collective and yet sequenced or segmented observation might help produce polyphony, the subject in process. In this sense, collaboration as grammar and method bring artistic form and social practice together. The very structure of the creative processes appears to foreground the complexities, and I quote, the give and take that lie at the heart of all human interaction. Thank you. That was uh, absolutely amazing. And as I always feel uh, after um, all of Professor Kapoor's uh, papers uh, that I've ever heard in my life, the density, the sheer sheer sort of breadth of what she manages to do in a limited amount of time is, uh, is, is really a nightmare to summarize for, for a moderator. But uh, I, uh, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of things that might uh, help us to connect to what um, Zuleika might be saying. Uh, um, one of the things that I was trying to also get at yesterday or during my paper is the notion that there are, in fact, uh, two notions of representation that often uh, sort of pervade our understanding of cultural politics and the interfaces between them. And uh, Gayatri Spivak had once called these two modes of representation, the proxy and the portrait. So the proxy being the question of political delegation, the way we think of representation in the political space uh, when we are uh, sort of mobilizing for justice, when we are mobilizing for uh, you know a representation in the parliament, et cetera, et cetera. And portrait, uh, especially when we speak of cultural representation and the question of legitimacy, the question of um, legitimate versus illegitimate representation, ethical representation is something that pertains to both spheres. And unlike what one might com commonsensically imagine, the spheres are deeply sort of imbricated and embedded in each other. So therefore often uh, at one level, the notion of um, of justice, uh, of witnessing of history, uh, the questions of uh, you know representing identities in the space of performance becomes very very important in a lot of political uh, sort of uh, uh, lot of thought about political theater and performance. Uh, but as a social, for example, like when there is a historical erasure, the notion that the space of performance might take on through embodiment the space of a historical archive. And as Rebecca Schneider would tell us, if the archives are the bones of the body, uh, performance is the flesh. So the archive is static, it's, 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 it represents a certain death that has already been announced, while flesh is flexible, it changes, it's unpredictable, and, and that the very definition of it is that it is constantly evolving. Um, but because it is constantly evolving, it erupts again and again in different ways. So it is not perhaps enough to say that theater is a space of representation when delegation fails, uh, portraiture takes over. But in fact, this world of you know, portraiture of cultural representation, of representation and performance is in fact unpredictable, messy, and not a clear and transparent transposition from the world of legal and political delegation to the world of, um, you know, uh, performance uh, is always possible, which is why we speak of performance also as transformation, not just as representation. Um, I say all of this in order to connect to uh, perhaps Zuleika's paper where she's talking about the actor as witness. And she's interested, as we already heard in the, in the introduction about the relationship between uh, law, performance and history. Uh, really looking forward to hearing you Zuleika, you have about 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you to KCC for inviting me. Thank you for the introduction, Trina. And thank you to Shrabashti, 
Titas and Gaurav, who will be um, helping me with uh, the videos. Um, the performative implies action and opens up questions of agency, how we live, how we identify ourselves and others, how we engage with and write history, and how we approach local versus global tensions and intersections. Can theater create spheres where alternatives can be collectively imagined, tried out, discussed, confronted? Can theater unfold its fundamental agonistic vigor in very different geographical, political, and artistic contexts, opening spheres of negotiation and debate in which contradictions are not only kept alive, but can above all be shaped and articulated? Can theater engage in contemporary social and political issues without compromising art or politics? What kind of knowledge can theater generate that activism and theory alone cannot? What does it mean for, uh, for theater to function not just in, but as public space? I'm interested in the connections between history, law, and theater as different narrative strategies which hold in common the tension between speculation and imagination, as well as truth finding and reality making. My investigations are around the question of what is reality and how is it represented. Projects such as Seen at Sikandrabagh, which is based on a photograph taken by war photographer Felice Beato uh, in 1858 at one of the sites of the uprising of 1857. Rehearsing the witness, the Bhaval court case, rehearsing Azad Hind radio, and my current project, restaging the trial of Bahadur Shah Zafar, are based on archival materials, historical events that may have occurred earlier, but seem to hold meaning and resonate in the present moment. Today is a result of and in continuation of what happened then. The ev event isn't over yet. When we talk of historical reality, we talk about something that does not exist in itself, but is the product of a work of imaginative reconstruction. Reenactment is an attempt to close the gap that has appeared between what has happened and how we talk about it. There are different levels of reality. The historical one that we can only experience in an indirect way and the theatrical one which is real as well as artificial, because it is always the result of a creative act. The reenactment does not exist. What exists is an acting practice that has to do with imagination and with precision. Reenactment consists of the agreement that everything is only a play, a picture, a reproduction, a repetition. Principally, the untidy process of thought and consideration with its related notions of contingency, interruption, uncertainty, version, repetition, and failure, are what constitute a rehearsal that pre proceeds to become the so-called real thing of performance. I consider rehearsal a way of thinking and as an operating strategy. When used as a strategy, the rehearsal foregrounds that which takes place on the periphery and that which may be obscured by the presentation of a polished and final piece. I believe the practices of rehearsal can appear as links between aesthetic judgment and social or institutional critique, making a claim for the aesthetic and political potential in the unfinished project. Rehearsing Azad Hind Radio is a 40 minute video placed within the set of a radio studio. The work reenacts selected broadcasts Subhash Chandra Bose made from Berlin on Azad Hind Radio. These outline his political philosophy and his strategies to attain independence and are interwoven with texts from the JNU Nationalism Lecture Series of 2016. The spine of rehearsing Azad Hind Radio uh, are my conversations with the actors on performing Bose. What do emotions, presence, and history mean in performance?
The space that I was inhabiting when I played the character of Bose was the um, authenticity or conviction, the truth with which he had felt, or I feel he had felt, the primarily political emotions and ideologies expressed in the speech and pledge. Emotions and ideologies that were utterly alien, even repugnant to me in my own person, if I were to think rationally and intellectually about and into them. All these different political things about him, these were as fundamentally other to me as the thickened eyebrow and moustache, the beard and the double-breasted suit that I had put on to get into the character of Bose. And this, I would repeat, was not empathy. Yet the process of coming to this realization of what he may have been like was a profoundly transformative experience. It was a transformation of one's identity. I would even go as far as to say that it was a transformation of one's sexual identity. I had become another kind of man. I had become another kind of male creature when I played both with regard to what I wore, with regard to my voice, my secondary sexual characteristics. Will come the end of the British Empire in India. This was also a transformation of my present into his past. And in that sense, not only an ideological or ontological, but also a historical transformation. I had I had entered into a kind of realization of a bit of history. What I'm trying to describe was not a personal or subjective experience, but an interpersonal or intersubjective one. The evolution of a movement is analogous. Perhaps to this that is what makes such a transformation or transaction between a self and another in a precise sense dialectical, dialogic or dialogic or to appropriate Bose's favorite political vocabulary this is the synthesis, the reconciliation but without conciliation of opposites, the reconciliation of opposites that happens when a thesis enters into a lived relationship with its antithesis. Considering everything, one is inclined to hold that the next phase in world history will produce a synthesis between communism and fascism. And will it be a surprise if that synthesis is produced in India? The legitimacy of a legal trial relies both on its foundational sovereign source of authority and on public perception. To these ends, trials historically have been staged events. They employ dramaturgic elements and theatrical devices. They have their particular scenography, their scripts, and roles assigned to each other, uh, to each specific actor. Trials also have their audience composed of the public, the media, and their critics. As events, they only complete themselves in the presence of this audience. Late legal scholar Robert Hoover proposed the world of law as a system of tension, which bridges concepts of reality to an imagined alternative. According to Kova, these polarities are maintained and moved forward through the device of the narrative. 
It is through narratives that we build and understand the relationship between our social constructs and our vision of potential futures. These narratives require a leap of imagination in order to connect not only what is and what should be, but also what might be. Both theater and law assert productions of truth and reality. The construction of narratives, a historical frame of reference, and the creation of alternative conditions with visions of the present. These parallels between theater and law allow us to ask what theater can uncover about the theatricality that is always present in courts and is integral to political life. How do we judge actions differently when they are staged in a theater rather than narrated in a courtroom? Legal judgment is presumably objective, fact and evidence-based. To experience and judge a trial aesthetically by contrast would mean to judge the case based on the virtuosity of the acting, on immediate impressions and emotions while watching, and on the atmosphere in the courtroom. Are legal and aesthetic judgments mutually exclusive? Mm -hmm. The trial projects, landscape as evidence, artist as witness, rehearsing the witness, the Bhaval court case, and the trial of Bahadur Shah Zafar, all take the form of staged commissions of inquiries with real lawyers, real judges, different kinds of expert witnesses who may be anthropologists, who may be historians, who may be legal scholars, who may be photographers, uh, with actors or artists as key witnesses. What happens when both sides of the argument are nuanced and valid? Or when both sides produce and construct the truth? Who defines what truth is and what constitutes evidence? And what kind of evidence and or testimony can the actor produce? The Bhaval court case was an extended court case in pre-independence India that revolved around the identity of a sannyasi claiming to be Ramendra Narayan Roy, the second Kumar of Bhaval the heir of one of the last largest Zamindari estates in undivided Bengal, who was presumed dead a decade earlier. The claim was contested by the British Court of Wards and by the widow of Ramendra Narayan Roy, Biba Bhati Devi. The case was in trial for 16 years from 1930 to 1946. A set of photographs in the Bhaval album which, is, which are 90 photographs that were used in evidence in the court case and which are part of the Alkazi collection of photography are of Kumar Ramendra Narayan Roy before his alleged death in Darjeeling, as well as of the plaintiff, the sannyasi, dressed to look like the Kumar. These photographs were used during the original trial to establish likeness between the plaintiff and the Kumar and thereby confirm identity Given the plaintiff's alleged loss of memory, another basis for my project rehearsing the witness, the Bhaval court case. The imposter actor is the central focus of my access into the Bhaval material and from where the project has spiraled outwards with three iterations over four years in terms of both its form and its content with the rehearsal and the audition as key ideas. The third and ongoing iteration of the project is in the form of a retrial. Initially performed at the Dhaka Art Summit in 2018, the retrial focuses on citizenship as performative, a template and a score, the successful performance of which is always the matter of an ongoing test. One achieves citizenship, one loses it, one's performance is either applauded or it fails to live up to the demands, the requirements and the standards that accrue to it. How is identity written into history and played out in the domain of the law, as opposed to the actual complexity of real lived experiences and relationships? This version represents the original Bhaval material and the historical event in order to examine it and critique it to produce the possibility of an alternate past, 
But the retrial also deconstructs and reconstructs the archival material to produce alternative possibilities of thinking about evidence and identity. The retrial is staged with a director, myself, a real lawyer and a real judge, which reenacts sections from the original testimonies as well as produces new ones. The witnesses, contemporary experts in their own fields, speak from original testimonies as well as offer his or her own opinion as an expert. The judgment is not pre-known. I do not remember, but I was there until the corpse was taken down the next morning. The Kumar's body lay on the bed in which he died. I threw myself on the bed and I was weeping. The next morning, they had taken the body, taken down the bed and all. The second Kumar's body was never removed from his room throughout the course of the night. After it was removed, I saw it one more time. It was left on the garden. Lay on it hard. Flowers were put on it. I could see the body from the upper story. The second Kumar's body was cremated on Sunday. On Monday, we left Darjeeling. After the death of the Kumar, I have taken over his share of the Bhawal estate. Since his death, I lead the life of a Hindu widow. Thank you. Oh, you are taking the next process of the examination. Yeah. What is your name? Samina Mitzvah. What is your education? I got a PhD in sociology. What is your occupation? I am an actor. So you are here to testify as the Rupati, but you know you are not the Rupati. Do you think you are qualified to testify as an expert? To me, performance is how I see the world and also how I want to see it. So it's a political position. It's about reality what was, what is, and what I can make it to, into a reality, to a more truthful one. So as a sociologist, uh, we look at an individual from outside, but as an actor, we have to start from inside. So you have to inhabit, in order to be able to uh, analyze the character of Vibhavati, you actually expose her and mine, truths and lies, but without judging. So, in that case, so what you are saying that Devavati in this 14 years has transformed to be an Arab person. And in that case, could not that be the case that due to this present freedom and the way of living is the main reason she was denying that this person is Kumar? So, when we talk about Vibhavati, I have already established that she was quite attached to her husband. So now, if you think even for me, if something happens and the husband dies and he returns, if I am or Vihavati is attached to the husband, it is very likely that she is going to accept him if she recognizes him as her husband. But what if Vihavati herself has changed? If she has become a different person from a frail young woman who didn't know what to do about life to someone who is assertive and independent, would that husband be recognizable to her? 
is it coming because uh, she was a woman and the woman's independence is dispensable? So you are trying to make a point that if it is a man, then he's a he's a feeling of pride. He's always expendable to someone else's right. Is that what you're trying to say? It's not about whether it's a man or not. The fact is, whoever is the most deprived here in the most disadvantaged position. Well, if you say the dis disadvantaged position, I can see there is a competing interest between the men and women. And this actually played a vital role in determining the judgment in the original case. Would you agree? Isn't it fairly likely? And isn't it what we see today, even 100 years after? From the deposition of Dilogati, if I come back to the context again, your expert witness, I can clearly conclude that your sense of right and liberty actually influenced your opinion in your deposition before this court. It is quite impossible to form an opinion of the facts without taking a position as a human being. Do you have anything to say about it? Why would you want to become neutral? In this case, if you look at the life, Today's life, even, there are so many competing interests. There is gender, sexuality, ethnicity, whether you are a migrant or not, whether you have a uh, passport valid or not. These kind of things, they are intersecting and sometimes they are at, at odds to each other. So, in such a case, what, uh, the, the thing that you base on is you do not want to be neutral. You have to take a position. You have to be, you, you have to be taking the position in favor of the person who is the most marginalized here. Acting is a form of reality production. An actor has been taught how to take on a character or become someone else. They use techniques of adjusting physicality, the construction of different emotions, and the production of affect to create a believable real. The actor is always acutely in the present, in the actual physical space in which the performance is taking place, but also elsewhere in that other time and place which she is helping the audience believe in. She is aware of her body, gesture and movement and its position in space, of what she is saying, of what she may be feeling, of all that she remembers. She has to be able to watch herself. She has to watch those watching her. She has to be alert and alive, ready to re respond to and calibrate everything in this moment and in the moment in the moments to come. What does it mean to not just watch, but also take action? And what does doing or acting entail? The reality and history of the actor's body and its synthesis with and of ideas becomes a powerful embodied way of thinking. Is the actor able to disarm frameworks of certainty by insisting on the ethical and epistemic vitality of the intimate, the desired, and the imagined, thereby producing caveats to what people think of or take for granted as the real. Equally, can the actor provoke and call into being entirely new frames for constructing meaning, acting as a catalyst? Does the figure of the actor offer a method of survival that meets the growing intensification of scrutiny with a strategy based on the multiplication of guises and the amplification of guile. Does the actor, who is everything and nothing, elude power and therefore perform a citizen who is fluid, multivalent, hybrid, and unsettled, dynamic? Thank you. Thank you so much, Zuleika. That was absolutely uh, fascinating and there's so much to say, but we are actually running quite late. So I will reserve my comments and move on directly to the next speaker, Urmimala Shalkar. Her paper is titled uh, Buy One, Get One. And um, I would request the participants to, if they already have some questions, to start typing them in the Q&A uh, section, not the chat section, in the Q&A section, so that once uh, Urmidi is done, we can go on directly to the discussion. Uh, Urmi Mala Sarkar, welcome. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, Kolkata Center for Creativity, uh, Shabosti and Tita well for organizing this wonderful conference. As a dancer choreographer in India, 
I have started worrying about agency quite late in my dance life. And I test out one of the strands of my thought with today's presentation with my paper titled, Buy One, Get One Free. In Bollywood dances and even in the Indian television reality dance shows, powerful plastic images of hyper-gendered male and female bodies are relentlessly recycled as commercial items, used for selling products, films, and lifestyle choices. I look at the consumption of Bollywood dance through David Harvey's concept of accumulation by dispossession. I use the theory of dispossession to understand the process by which female sexuality is appropriated as property by the market economy through, though it is often hoarded by women, to drive the hyper-masculine film and television industry of India. The dispossession of women is inevitable in this context, as they merely hold in trust their assets, in this case, body, skills, sexuality, for the rightful owners or the highest bidders. The agency and the rights to the body and the magic it can create through the display and use of skills in dance are commodities, where, where buying one means getting the other free. Hence, the women actors of mainstream Bollywood cinema today need to have two saleable assets at the same time. Their cultivated looks to cater to the idea of beauty, and the skills to move their bodies to create an image of hypergendered sexuality. This also works in the opposite direction, whereby a woman dancer, specifically contracted to perform in a dance number, would automatically be expected to come with a great body and the skill to titillate sexually. The body and the dance becomes coupled as two-in-one products as consumables that are usually sold together. In the list of assets that are necessary in order to gain entry in this competitive world, capacity to act or a serious training in dance comes later in the list of must-haves. Women actors also have very short screen lives as they mark, their market values are proportional to their objectified physical assets. Instead of increasing the woman's capacity to bargain in the changing time, the perpetual uncertainty about self-marketability and fear of being highly replaceable make women perpetually vulnerable and the market becomes more and more controlled by the buyers. I understand local popular dance and dancing bodies as commodities, therefore. And imagine the possibility of replacing terms like aesthetic with marketability, an audience with buyers. It also problematizes the duality and replaceability, replicability of terms of reference like labor, dedication, commitment, which are commonly used in the high art parlance of classical dance in India, but have little applicability in contemporary Bollywood dances. I see dance items as saleable products within a vast network of practices and transactions. Where, when marketability is the legitimized goal, idea of technique, form, and skill which have otherwise governed the traditional world of Indian dance are completely redefined. Important is the site where the product is consumed, either metaphorically or literally. This is where the question of the popular and the constantly advertised dance numbers from Bollywood movies need to be critically understood as a dominant cultural driver in India's neoliberal economy. To be a product appreciated and marketed worldwide, it has to be conceptualized and produced according to, a certain, according to certain demands that are assumed to be global in nature. 
as Bollywood emerges as a popular genre, much sought after as a form by eager learners everywhere, it also resists cutting off its so-called connection with its roots in dance forms within India. That is conveniently, that, uh, that it conveniently reiterates time and again to keep the historically exotic connections intact for its marketability. Global Bollywood has constructed its own fictitious, ideal male and female bodies, dance movements, and the choreography using products, processes, and techniques from all over the world to construct whatever it thinks would sell around the globe. The over-sexuated use of the female body are constructed through dance movements. The sensual use of chest, hips, lower abdomen, completely different from Indian classical dances. In effect, Bollywood has created an alternative Indian-ness by regularizing these deviant forms through relentless repetition. Bollywood's particular culture of consumption works well with neoliberal practices. Its products, consumable packages of unreal stories supported by a make-believe world and the detectable act delectable actor's bodies, supply the demand of a growing chain of markets at home and abroad. The precarity of its workers, particularly those of women who fear they are all too replaceable and therefore choose to acquire a more perfect body is in stark contrast with the projection of these women in media as free agents in the liberalized economy, as well as successful, independent human beings making informed choices about owning a certain kind of body living a particular life of celebrity and being the object of adoring gazes of millions. In reality, the gaze directed at women's bodies is far more judgmental than that suffered by men. Women in Bollywood, heroines as well as the item dancers, are paid less than the male counterparts. Women are more vulnerable in their disposability due to the uncertainty of their careers as they age or after their bodies change due to motherhood. Though many female Bollywood performers have expressed their frustration and anger on this discriminatory practice, there has been no real protest for fear of retribution. Feminine and masculine stereotypes become part of transactions that create bodies for this industry. Those aspiring to succeed, to succeed in television or film start by acquiring a marketable body, a saleable look. An ideal body in terms of hair type, body weight, skin texture are prerequisites to such aspirations. Unlike in the past, none of this is impossible anymore. Everything can be bought. In other words, transactions occur at every phase where in exchange for a price a certain product can be bought that will help create a virile six-pack or any other bodily quality whether it is a male or a female yet at the same time bollywood aspirants need to acquire skills as well dance classes are a must but for bollywood career one does not need to learn a form and practice a technique to the exclusion of everything else. The more fluid one is about catching on to new dance movements by imitating and reproducing them, the more he, is, he or she is appreciated. Thus the skill sets for traditional dance practices and popular Bollywood dances are completely different. Dance captured on camera demands entirely different technical requirements and a completely different set of skills. Here, the dancer has only to learn short movement sequences and to reproduce them for a certain shot. There is scope for several shots and a chance of doing a better job 
till the shot is made final. The camera also does a lot of work for the dance. Along with the editing, it enhances, speeds up, or slows down dance movements, takes close-ups, cuts out unwanted parts of movements to create the final dance. It is known to be a common practice that the feet of many dancers have been edited into shots when a Bollywood dancer is shown to be doing difficult feet work, foot work, but actually cannot do it skillfully. Sometimes dummy dancers perform different dances, difficult dances shot at, uh, on, on uh, you know, two bodies. All this is process of creating the perfect dance. Once the final version goes into a film and is seen by the audience, there is no way that the image can be replaced. This image becomes a part of public memory to be seen and archived in, and in digitized form for eternity. Thus, from product, uh, production to viewing, the outcome of the filmic dance is more a product of technologies such as camera, lenses, lights, edits, than of a dancer's effort, practice, skill, and presentational ability. Once she or he is chosen for the body that she or he has been able to create through buying the correct face, body, hair, skin color, and type, she or he becomes another of these materials that digital technology can cut and paste to its satisfaction. The woman is naturally more vulnerable in this ruthless market. Expectations of her and her body are far greater than those of any man as her body is required to show and sell her sexuality and sensuality. Bollywood's brand is based on highly objectified and fetishized commodity of the woman's body. A woman performer may not necessarily need to learn the skills of dance. She only needs to acquire a saleable body. The terms accumulation and dispossession assume further complex implications in this context. In comparison to what any other skilled artist earns in India, Bollywood actors are remunerated at much higher rates. In fact, classical dancers earn a fraction of this salary paid to Bollywood dancers. But at the same time, the control over the right to remain in the industry is never given to a woman in Bollywood. Their careers depend on the whims and fancies and evaluations of their marketability. The revenue that is generated by the movie industry pushes one to understand the accumulation at the cost of the precarity it generates for its women, whereby their extreme disposability and replicability, their actual and emotional dispossession are in fact a byproduct of the constant need for the industry to be in a cutthroat competitive readiness, ruthless in its choice of market-friendly consumables. At this point, the word reception that is usually used in case of audience in audiovisual audio mediums, such as performing arts and films, may be replaced by consumption, a word that has more resonance with the reference to the tangible products of consumer culture and to the obsessive fetishization of the hypergendered body that drives consumption. We see this in the marking of difference in Bollywood dance items where the gaze is constantly drawn to the qualities of the female otherness through titillating glimpses of calves or legs, highlighted buttocks, exposed upper back, partially or fully covered, but accentuated breasts, exposed waist, and transparent or semi-transparent attire. One might view this exposure as a sign of empowerment, wherein women dancers in films are seen by many apologists in Bollywood to be willing and eager collaborators as sexually expressive agents, symbolizing enfranchised power. It is in this sense that the feminist corrective becomes important. In terms of gender politics, these fetishized bodies are extremely dispossessed ones. 
they struggle with the precarity of their labor, appearing powerful as owners of gestures and movement, but actually working totally under the control of the logic of a buyer driven market. Thus, the buyer's dream sign, buy one, get one free, is a reality for the female aspirant for Bollywood roles, who is always living a life of precarity while buying, while trying to increase her market value. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to Professor Urmimala Sharkar. So many things come to mind. I was actually uh, thinking of uh, Laura Mulvey's classic essay and how she actually talks about the, the how Hollywood fragments women's bodies uh, in order that the sexuality, the woman's sexuality becomes less of a, uh, of uh, an anxiety for for male viewers, so you have these body parts that are fragmented, so that so that the the uh, the woman's desiring gaze does not in fact become a threat to the 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 male uh, ego libido in a certain way. So that's that's interesting. There's there's so much there to talk about. And for Zuleika, I was also wondering about whether uh, you know one would like to reflect on um, some of the 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 literature that comes out of trauma theory and the questions of testimony in sort of in uh, uh, say perhaps perhaps out of some of the reflections on the Holocaust, for example, where uh, for people like Kathy Karuth or Soshana Feldman, the notion that one, many of these Holocaust survivors, when they came to the court to testify, often broke down, cried, showed all kinds of system, uh, symptoms of hysteria, which in the traditional court would have disqualified them as witnesses, as being of unsound mind. But because uh, and the argument emerges that because this is a history of trauma, these very symptoms of almost disarray, chaos, lack of clarity, in fact, even, or even failures of memory become a sort of a different kind of testimony in a way. So I, I think I think a lot of um, uh, performance studies that uh, that sort of uh, derives out of these situations of quotidian trauma uh, sort of talks about these juridical modes of writing history and how a certain kind of performative testimony can rupture that kind of linear mode. But I'll stop there. There are quite a few questions that have already been uh, collected here. And I would like to now formally open the, uh, the floor for questions. And I start with a question uh, that has come in last. This is from Mayurakshi Sen. Mm, and she says such fascinating presentations today that uh, have really pointed me towards so many different avenues of thought. I wanted to ask if Dr. Kapoor could elaborate a bit more about the dramaturgical strategies of creating effective and affective social performances by disjointing the body. How can this be used to encourage ethical spectatorship? Should I repeat, uh, no, rather? Yeah, please do. Please uh, do. Dramaturgical strategies of creating effective and affective social performances by disjointing the body. Can this be used to encourage ethical spectatorship? Let me try. I think one of the things that perhaps uh, disjointing the body, uh, uh, the point that I was trying to make is that once you disjoint the body, then you're able actually to see the nature of construction. And if you begin to see the nature of construction, I mean, for instance, I, we all know that uh, classical acting, uh, sort of Natya Shastra also disjoints the body and is ready to actually place a situation where each body part is, is skilled. Now, I think if you can find ways of making a performance where the disjointed doesn't come together, and uh, I mean, can actually be segmented maybe I'm not sure whether it necessarily will produce ethical spectatorship, but it might actually produce what one might say as uh, uh, an alert spectatorship, alert to the construction of the body as an ideological structure. I'm not sure that it can actually, I mean, it need not necessarily carry on as uh, ethical in, from one production to the other, but if, if one is able to see the body as something that is a construction, and that possibly leads us to an understanding of the nature of construction that it has gone through. I'll go on to uh, another question, and there's, there's more for uh, Anuradha, but I just want to take one that seems to be uh, for uh, Urmidi. 
this is from Raju Rana and he asks, are there any chances for item girls to exercise their agency against the prevalent gender, no gender norms since their professional career is market driven and full of uncertainty? So um, I just um, think that it's such a market driven kind of a space that uh, whatever small bits and pieces of agency is created through a, through a particular kind of own ownership of a kind of a movement or, or, or trying to do one's own bit or, or actually, you know, sticking to certain kinds of codes of uh, payment or timings or how much strain or how much time she would give for the for for a certain kind of an item um, or whether she would be placed side by side equally with another male uh, dancer an actor who is doing the item number with her all these kinds of small things uh, may probably work from person to person differently depending on what kind of position that person has, that, that, uh, that actress or the dancer has. But the problem is that it all depends on where she is in terms of her, of, of her market value at that moment. The market value could be raised and at that point she could be able to get that, you know, hold on to a certain form of a precarious agency, which may at any point of time disappear again. So it's really a precarious and a shifty space where she belongs. I hope I won, uh, understood the question rightly. All right, uh, there's one from Srabosti actually uh, for Professor Kapoor. What was your journey of negotiation as a woman director to establish your work while mostly the theater field was male dominated? Could you say again, please? I just lost that. What was your journey of negotiation as a woman director to establish your work while most of the theater field was male dominated? You know, um, this is a question that I, I mean, I've had, uh, I mean, I've had occasion to answer over several parts of my uh, own uh, life uh, uh, as, as, as a theater maker. Um, I think that there have been different stages of the way that uh, this field has to be negotiated. As a younger woman, I think it was uh, it had to deal. It it was to do with a, a situation where uh, the constant uh, the nature of how uh, how choices or how methodology was seen was often uh, the case that I didn't. I mean, as women directors, we seemed not to have methodology. That was one part. And the other part, as we grew older and more work came along, it was the nature of seeing what, what is the construction of the work, and which is what I try to draw attention to in, in the presentation, that the structure of the work was often seen as uh, weak or meandering or whatever. And that makes, a, that makes it as, you know, that there was a certain kind of formal as well as uh, Methodologic, methodological position in which we didn't seem to fall very easily. Either we didn't know methodology or what we knew was not good enough to the structure that had already been given. That's why I think there has been a constant interest in women uh, theater makers to deal with structure, both as pedagogy as well as with uh, uh, the space to make. And structure then is not always a given. And that's been the major, I think, dialogue. I, 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 and now I don't know whether there's a confrontation, but there is certainly a, still a running dialogue about methodology and the way that it is used, as well as the grammar that comes out of that methodology. Uh, there's a question from Preeti Mathur. Uh, how must the general public uh, interpret dance responses to geopolitical issues. And this is uh, meant for the panel uh, altogether. I would also like to just remind the audience that Professor Anana Chatterjee is here. She delivered the keynotes. If you have questions or comments for her, you can also send them here uh, and she could also respond. Uh, this, I think, also pertains to Anur uh, Anunadi's paper. How must the general public interpret dance responses to geopolitical issues? It's a fairly broad question, but 
if Urmidi or Anunadi would like to take it or anybody else. Anunya, would you like to go? Uh, I, sorry, yes, I, I totally, I was thinking about that question. First of all, thanks to all the other panelists for a remarkable uh, thoughts. Um, I think that the question that I, the, the word that I get stuck on is this idea of must, right? How must the general public interpret dance? I think that because dance has been so uh, relegated to this zone of entertainment for so long, actually globally, um, I think the idea that dance makes its own commentary, that dance allows us to um, actually think through or offers provocations in embodied ways is something that we have to invite audiences to. Um, and I hope that they can see that dance is not this museumized thing, but actually arising from the fabric of the concerns that we are grappling with every day. So I hope that I, 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 I hope that we can all through conversations like these and others, um, I think theater is actually done a much better job, but dance remains uh, really shackled to these notions of, um, to these very difficult notions of really something that is, does it have to mean something? Um, does it have to, does it have to uh, invite us to even think about what the body can, how the body can signify at certain moments. I agree with Ananya totally. Uh, so I think, I mean, we place ourselves, like I was saying yesterday also, that in dance, thinking that, you know, you have the right to think, it's something that is not taught to dancers themselves. And when the presentation is done, the, 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 uh, the, the field is, um, you know, marked so clearly and no aberration is almost allowed. So dance themes, dance bodies, you have to stick to a certain kind of aesthetic in order for you to see that body dancing. And the thing is that that is why the dance doesn't generate either in the dancer or the viewer the right in itself to be creative, to, to explore ways in which that particular song may mean a certain thing when the body has been, you know, gone through domestic abuse, for, for example, or, you know, the body has been displaced from home, has lost its home, or even the dancer has gotten married and changed her house and the food habit has changed, everything has changed. So the body has to remain, the dance has to remain unchanged. It cannot show anything else but that very perfect method and technique of showing. So that is why this, this whole agency, this, but, but there are histories of creative processes which have been undermined. It's, it seems as if there is no history of creative processes in India. That's not true. There have been people who have created uh, before, but it has been sidelined through kind of, you know, a refusal to think that there has been no modern uh, technique, there has been no way of thinking. So the classical dance has ruled. So I think if there, is a, there is a necessity to understand that dance has had different kinds of lives within Indian context as well. And it's, it's a faulty way of recording dance history that has created this notion that dance doesn't speak of life or dance cannot speak of life. And I agree with uh, Ananya that it doesn't really appear to be speaking of life at all, at most of the time. Uh, there has been no questions for Zuleika yet, so I uh, would uh, like to exercise my privilege to maybe pose a question, uh, which is that there is, of course, uh, you know, uh, from you had a lot of concerns in your paper, but one of the uh, sort of concerns that I perhaps share with you vis-a-vis uh, -vis my work is the notion that uh, uh, the witnessing that performance is capable of a certain kind of embodied memory and the performance of that is capable of a certain kind of witness, which juridical and archival history sometimes disallow. 
allows, especially in situations of conflict, emergency law, military law, et cetera, et cetera. But there is also that other side. And I was thinking of Claude Lanzmann's film Shoah and where, you know, uh, Lanzmann actually interviews a number of, you know, survivors of the Holocaust over time. It's a very, very long film. And sometimes uh, the filmmaker as ethnographer uh, appears to be the one who's in fact um, reenacting a kind of violence, uh, you know? So the, just the act of extracting that witnessing or, or that recounting of the trauma is in fact, uh, in some cases, an act of violence. So, so people who, who have dealt with this, uh, this history in different ways choose not to speak about it. They are over time kind of worn down to a point where they actually give testimony to the camera. And that appears in many cases almost a difficult thing to watch because we just feel like, you know, why don't you just leave them alone, right? So I'm asking whether this extraction of testimony is less violent in the case of performative experiments, more so in juridical cases. What do you think? I mean, is, is there a violence involved in that testimonial process as well? Yes, I, I, I mean, at one level, yes. I think, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just going to speak in terms of performance. Um, yes, I think it can be quite violent in a way. Uh, I mean, I spend a lot of time speaking to a whole bunch of people, some of whom I cast, some of whom, you know, I'm kind of auditioning as it were. Uh, I think in the process of it's a it's it's a double-edged thing. Where do you ask the question which sort of hurts the most in a way? <laughs> um, you know, but in fact is the most important question to ask. And I think the process, I think it's about the process, which is why, I mean, partly, uh, you know, most of the trial projects have taken about two years to make because it's in the time of also making the making of the work and the conversing with people um, that each time you push a little further, right? Each time you ask a little more, each time sometimes the person is willing to speak more. And that's, uh, you know, I feel we have to agree to get to that point. We have to together agree to get to that point. I don't know if that answers your question, but in a way, I mean, I, I find it a double-edged thing personally. It's it's a it's a process that uh, well, it's a process for me for me too. How far do you push? How much do you really want? But it's important to really also push, you know. Um, and I think also the thing about affect is something that I'm thinking about a lot because it's it's a strategy that the right deploys really well. Uh, and we see that all the time. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I've spent the last uh, five, six months, particularly actually since um, since the end of last year, actually thinking about this, when, when it is a strategy that the, the right deploys so well, um, you know, in, it, it's, again, it's two ways to think about it. Is it also a, about um, finding a strategy to, to combat that? Um, uh, or is it about, who, you know, so who deploys it best? Is it about that? You know? Um, so I, I think it's, a, it's something that really actually uh, I find really complicated to think through in coming back, you know, and bringing it back to, to, to my own work because I'm in the process of making another one. And so it's, uh, you know, so it's a very alive question for me. There's so much to say there. I think this could be a whole conversation in itself, but we already have two uh, very long questions. And I think I needed to remind people that the keynote was still here. So there are two questions for Anunadi, two pretty long and complex questions, but I'll try to quickly uh, uh, go through them. Uh, this is from Vaishnavi K. That this was a brilliant panel. I thank you, and I wanted to ask a question to Miss uh, Ananya. I wanted to understand, as you explained, how you broaden the category of women to perform and curate performances around, and as well as raising many issues of social justice. That also brings with it multiple conflicting person perspectives and realities as well. 
as a group, as the director, how do you navigate such dynamics? Would that mean there needs to be a common ground that as women, we've all gone through struggles which have something in common, but then many won't agree to that. If you could throw more light on this. So how do you sort of negotiate these multiple? So is there a common ground as a woman? So when I began working with, a, you know, the group of artists that I invited, um, I, that was my assumption that as women of color, as we understood ourselves at that time, we had shared experiences around the double, uh, the multiple kind of um, the intersecting, intersecting axes of both patriarchy and racism, uh, classism, sexuality. Um, and we could maybe talk about those, those shared ex resonant experiences, but also find um, how we were different. And I really learned from colleagues uh, who were Black, who are Black, or Indigenous, from other communities about the particular journeys by which we arrive at this category of women. But then I, I think over time, what I've begun, begin, what I've understood inevitably is how much, um, you know, to, I've begun to investigate this category of womanness. And there have been people who identify as femme, but who do not look, um, who do not look, uh, who may look more male identified um, on the surface, but, but themselves categorize themselves as femme. Um, who have become part of the work. That meant that I had to re-understand the way in which I offered corrections, um, the way in which I understood um, the body and how, you know, how to give, how to give actually feedback, how to choreograph the body differently, what it meant to find um, solidarity. Um, along with difference. That's why I keep thinking about how difference itself becomes the organizing category. And I think Sarah Ahmed has written very beautifully about that. This concept of difference is what holds us together. Um, what, is, what we do share, however, is a notion of progressive politics and that we can actually at times share rhythm. But that also helped me to understand how choreography could heighten if we hold the same rhythm, but we don't do simultaneous choreography, so we're not doing all doing one, two, and three, and four, but we reimagine that in different ways, this notion of asynchronicity in ensemble choreography, um, it really helped me to materialize that notion of difference in the center of all of us. Um, thank you, Anunadi. There's probably time for just a couple more, so I'll quick, quickly go through this. This is for Urmima Nadi. Um, so Sanjukta Wag is asking this question. It's time we break the binary of classical dance versus Bollywood dance, high art versus popular culture. We have more in common than we accept. Uh, the hierarchies of male gaze and market value pervade all worlds, Bollywood, classical, contemporary, dance and theater. There have been works of resistance against the non-normative uh, body and consumer culture in all worlds. Urmidi, would you like to take that? Yeah. So Samjukta, thank you for your uh, question. And I know from where you are coming. And I agree on one platform that there, the market, when you talk of market, it's uh, more like across the world, it's coming to that place of cutthroat uh, cutthroat competition and survival. But I think we still have to categorize these places like Bollywood because the vulnerability is also because there is no space in terms of any kind of protection from the government in the sense that the whole lot of the protections in classical dances even if it is not equally distributed, even if it is not available for everyone, there is a kind of sense of protection in terms of classical dances. And because I have, I have transformed the whole paper and the whole, uh, uh, the, the whole argument into, I've tried to look at it as a kind of economic kind of space rather than a dance studies paper, an economically understood paper, I was trying it out to see if this vulnerability can change, this economic vulnerability can change the terms of reception. And I'm, I'm very willing and open 
to open it up to all forms of dancers. But I want to see something that is made as marketable products and the bodies are made as, you know, driven by that, that demand of a marketable body where you create everything piece by piece. The body is created piece by piece. The act, the technique, the skill set, as I call it, it's like a toolbox that you create. It's not like how you nurture your classical technique. And it's not a recognition that you get from the governmental sources in any manner. So that's where I was drawing the difference. And I am very willing to extend this and see this, how this goes in terms of, you know, removal of bi binaries. Okay, so very quickly, one last question, and uh, this is from Devlina Tripathi for Professor Anana Chatterjee. Uh, it's fascinating to hear personal experience of inter intersections of feminist ideologies and the process of theatre making. I would love to hear more about this. Professor Chatterjee, as a practitioner, which came first? Was the choice of practices informed by ideology, or did the awareness that the practices embody certain ideologies come later? So did, did the ideology form the practices? or did the practices uh, sort of bring you to the, to the ideology? I think this is an interesting question. Thank you. Um, I have to say, I, I'm going to offer a really short anecdote. Um, so, you know, this notion of um, ideology, this is something that happened one time I was working with, um, you know, Girija Devi used to have this uh, little place in Taliganj. And we used to, we were rehearsing this dance drama called Krishna Mai. And one of the artists had experienced uh, domestic violence and she was dancing the role of Krishna. And she came in in this state to rehearsal. And so I, you know, I asked Guruji, how is she going to dance this role of Krishna? She's like, talk, you're talking about love and she just experienced its historic failure. And he said, in our dance, we only talk about the ideal. We're not concerned about the real. And for me, that became like a rupture in my consciousness that we, you know, like the rupture that kept on cleaving me apart. So this idea that the ideal was what was always embodied in the classical world was what was difficult for me. And so the, that once I recognized that I always had to think about, yes, this is beautiful, and how do I arrive at that beauty? It's not a given. It's not a given for so many people. And how do people, and more and more, I find the way in which people are always kept out of its doors, right? So I think that came first, this note, the, the, the experience of the beauty being shattered by the realization of the ideologies came first. And now when I see how uh, you know, especially at this time, how these practices are being co-opted again and again by fundamentalist government, actually here as well, um, and fundamentalist practices, it really, it terrifies me how beauty, uh, apparently this idealized beauty can be in the service of so much violence. Um, brilliant answer and a wonderful note to end on, a lot to ponder over. Uh, I would like to thank all the panelists. It was an incredible evening for me as well. It was wonderful to see uh, all of you women who I love and admire uh, immensely. And uh, I will now hand over uh, to our younger colleague, Harshra Bosti Ghosh, for the rest of the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Trinari, and thank you all. I think we can go on but we need to stop. But I would like to take this moment to thank our outreach partners who have really helped us to do this conference. We want to thank Anina Dance Theatre, Minneapolis, USA, Shaduna Center for Advancement of South Asian Culture, Dhaka, Bangladesh, Flem University, Pune, Sandbox Collective, Bangalore, School of Women's Studies, Jadavpur University, and our exclusive radio partner, Red FM. Thank you. Um, now, I would request our director, Ms. Rana Dewan, to present concluding note for today's session. Thanks, Rabhusti. What to say? It's really had been an enriching and knowledge sharing journey. And I'm glad that this platform has been created in these two days. While our keynote speakers, panelists, moderators have enriched the conference, I want to mention about the participants for their questions. 
that has helped them to make a flow in the conversation more engaging uh i'm only wondering how a male men's perspective would have been in this conference which i'm missing now and uh, we hope that you know in the next conversation we do engage them as well and i would definitely be glad to see this kind of uh, equality coming even in the presentation of the panelists uh, it's a wonderful beginning for us and we hope to take this forward i thank all the panelists once again moderator thank you so much uh, for for taking out time and talking of the of the things which matter the most at times and especially in times like this i want to thank the outreach partners once again and we hope that this is just the start of this uh, togetherness and we take it further and we keep meeting with each other and continue to have these conversations thank you each one of you thanks on behalf of kcc i would like to thank all of you for your individual contribution and now for our audience i would like to say you will receive a feedback form from us i uh, would request all to share your feedback because we are really looking forward to that as your feedback will help us to grow and will encourage us to work better i hope to see you all in cases again and till then good night and stay safe